So as a psychologist, I am a neuropsychologist and I work with people with ADHD a lot. And I do assessments and I do quite a bit of coaching now. And I've noticed that it's become more and more um, a very common complaint and popular request um, in my practice. And so it seemed like a reasonable topic to put to put in psychology about seeing as it seems like such a timely conversation a lot of people are having with their psychologists and physicians. So I'll do my best to talk about some of the common problems that I see in my practice in my coaching work um, over at Boss of Your Brain, we call them bosses. So I know there's some bosses in the group tonight. So hello, bosses. Nice to see you. Thanks for supporting me and showing up. Um, so what we think about when we think about um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is it's really, it's not a great name. It's not an attention deficit, actually. What it is a deficit of is attentional control. We don't have a, a hard time paying attention sometimes. You know, everyone will have heard of hyperfocus. What we have a hard time doing is controlling our attention and controlling where it goes and where it, we don't want it to go. And I say we intentionally. I live with ADHD and I manage it and it's never going to be gone, but I manage it. And if you're a person who has it or you're wondering if you have it, it is manageable, but it does take quite a bit of effort every day on my part. And so there are things you can do that will help make your daily life better. I promise. So there's three big problems I hear about all the time. Overwhelm, distractibility, and procrastination. So when we think about overwhelm, it can look like lots of different things, but the most common ways I see it in adults, oops, is they tell me they're disorganized. So there's just, I put this post-it notes here because I have a hate on for post-its. There's post-it notes everywhere and people lose track and they feel disorganized. People with ADHD get overwhelmed because they are not good at estimating how long things take. People with ADHD tend to experience time as fluid rather than finite. And so we always think we have enough time to squeeze one more little thing in before we leave. And we don't actually have enough time because we have typically grossly underestimated how long it will take anyway. So we're often late. In brackets here, I've put now versus not now. We're late or we don't do things when they should be done because if we don't do them now, not now is usually never. So in my case, I try to do things the first time I see them because that's now, because if I don't do them then, not now usually means never. So this now versus not now is something I use to help keep myself um, from putting things aside and losing track of them. I hear about difficulty making complex decisions a lot. And the overwhelm comes from all of the choices. Um, I made a YouTube video about this because it's such a common problem, making a decision and really trying to be thoughtful and think through all the options and do your research. It's a huge demand on our working memory to actually hold it all. And we often get overwhelmed and then make an impulsive choice at the end. So after all of that work, we just want the decision to be made and we make an impulsive choice, which is really tragic after all that effort, we don't actually take advantage of the effort. So that can make us frustrated and overwhelmed. So the frustration can be um, just a little bit of frustration or it can build, or we can you know, have a little bit of dysregulated anger and we can be frustrated and impulsive, which usually ends up being an emotional outburst. Commonly, people talk about kind of a blow up that's like quick to anger and then it's over quite quickly because it was really more impulsivity um, as opposed to an actual angry reaction that lasts a long time. That can happen too, but this is a common one, these impulsive emotional outbursts and you say something you maybe you didn't want to say. So that's overwhelm. The second big group, distractibility. So when we talk about forgetfulness, it isn't so much that we've forgotten, it's that we never learned it in the first place. Attention is the gate to memory. And so we people experience us as forgetful because we did not remember to do the thing that they asked us to do, but in fact, it never got in in the first place. We can be distracted by our own thoughts. So we might be trying to do some task, but we have just a barrage of noise 
happening in our head. This is commonly a source of anxiety, and then the anxious thoughts can also add to that um, distraction. That impulsivity that can come out as anger, of course, it's, it can come out in other ways. And so we might get distracted by something, and then we're there. We're acting without thinking. So we might be interrupting a conversation. We might be hijacking a conversation and changing the topic. And so we are distracted by something internal, and then we act on that, sometimes inappropriately. I hear this one so much. People often say they have a hard time sleeping because they are going over their day and they're anxious about they've said something wrong or impulsively, or they're worried about what they forgot, or they're trying to make sure that they've got their next day planned. You know, they might be writing notes by the bedside or they're just trying to keep it in their mind. It's a huge problem. And they that distraction interferes with their sleep, which of course makes the next day go more poorly. We might be distracted by our environment. So we have a messy workspace or a messy desk or our kitchen is a mess and we can't actually get over that in order to focus in on what we want to do. And so the mess itself becomes a barrier to doing whatever task we want to do. Or we might start cleaning up our desk, but then we get hyper-focused into organizing our file cabinet and we still don't do the first task that we meant to do. I can't see everybody, but I suspect there's some nodding happening. And I talked earlier about impulsively interrupting or changing the topic. The constant chattiness that for kids can be like the hyperactivity symptom and is often one of the ones that translates into adulthood. It, the noise in our head can come out of our mouth. So we're just, we have constant ideas, chaos in our heads, and it's just, a stream can be coming out of our mouth and we might not even realize that we are chatting. Um, my partner and I have a joke that I can talk right through a movie. It's true. And I don't even realize I'm doing it. I know it's hilarious. It's not hilarious for everybody else. <laughs> Sorry, I touched my headphones. I won't do that again. All right. The other big problem, procrastination. So we might be pulled into doing lots of little tasks because we get that lovely dopamine hit of completing a task and feeling good about ourselves because we've completed the task, which we don't think we can get from the big task, which overwhelms us and we don't know where to start. So we procrastinate the big task, but we still can kind of tell ourselves a story that we're being productive because we're doing all these other little tasks that are unrelated. Sometimes people with ADHD have a need for deadline pressure. And so they don't understand why they always leave things to the last minute. You know, they just simply cannot move themselves to action without the pressure of the deadline. And so they don't want that. They don't want, it's stressful for them, but it's a habit that they're in and they don't understand it. Sometimes this can relate to um, a portion of people with ADHD seem to have low arousal. And so without kind of the adrenaline hit that comes from the impending deadline and the fear of consequences, we're not alert enough or, or able, like we can't think that clearly without the adrenaline. And so this is actually a real thing that can happen to people. And we have to figure out how to work with that and maybe get the adrenaline another way. And perfectionism. I talk about this a lot in coaching. Perfectionism is an enormous source of procrastination. It can stop us from starting, but more often it stops us from finishing. So we've started something and now our perfectionism comes in and we either want to keep fixing it or we are, we don't think we can ever do it to the standard we want. So we just never finish because then we can never fail. So we wanted to do a fancy poll. So let's see if I can do it because we want to know which one is your biggest problem. So let me see if I can do the poll. We were having some technical issues. Relaunch poll. All right. I'm hoping people see the poll. Excellent. So interestingly, the results were pretty even, which has actually been my experience. It's People with ADHD are all, all different from each other. ADHD is a wide, um, let me get that out of the way there. It's quite varied in its presentation. 
And while there are core features, and certainly in adults, executive dysfunction, so the disorganized thinking, problems with planning, the time estimation, difficulty scheduling, and meeting deadlines, that's a huge source of distress for adults. But I think the the problem that we experience, the one that bothers us the most, is quite unique to each person and maybe the demands of their lives and their jobs. So I will go back to my presentation now. All right. So for those of you who either couldn't decide, all three were your problem, or you wanted to hear more, a little bit more about managing overwhelm, I got you covered. So one of the things that we always do when with our bosses and in my coaching practice is we have them track their activities because until you know where your time goes, you have no control over it. So when you when if you think about a calorie tracker, when you first go on a diet, you have to figure out, you have to keep track of what you eat. And I'm not a fan of diets, but I will say that every time I've done that and I've actually noted down everything I eat, it becomes quite apparent that I eat more than I think. And it's not hard to understand why maybe I'm not, I haven't lost weight if that's what I was trying to do. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, consider spending a little bit of time paying attention to where your time goes. You undoubtedly spend more time on um, kind of unproductive tasks or distracting tasks like Facebook, social media, web surfing, whatever it is, then you realize. And once you get a handle on that, your overwhelm will be less because you won't be wasting as much time each day. I have my preferred time management strategies. You know, I'm a paper calendar person with a com combining with my, you know, online calendars. I like the writing down process, but I don't mind if my bosses don't want to use that. You find one that works for you. What matters the most is that you use it consistently. You find some time management strategy that allows you to consistently keep track of things so that if someone gave you, like if you're at the dentist and they're like, would you like an appointment card? You're like, oh no, I would never need that because you're putting it right into your calendar because you're going to lose that appointment card inevitably. So whatever strategy you have, it has to be available to you when you're out. You have to be able to access it and it has to be simple. It just has to work for you. So find one and use it consistently. Sleep hygiene is such an incredible part of every psychological problem that we see. And ADHD is no exception. When I think of sleep, it's and I think of humans, it's like the base of our pyramid. If your sleep is poor, the pyramid will collapse. And so if you're ruminating at night, anxious about what you did wrong the next day, what you have to do the next day, if you are a hyperactive person that hasn't had enough exercise, so you're jacked up when you're trying to go to bed and you can't sleep, if you haven't, if you're taking medication or you're using a lot of caffeine to try and do that arousal thing that I talked about earlier and you're doing it too late in the day, you will not sleep. All of these things need to be addressed so that you can go to sleep at the same time about every day, but most importantly, that you can wake up at the same time every morning and get your rhythm within your body consistent. I cannot stress enough how important that is for ADHD and every other psychological problem. All right, distractions. So for those of you who said distractions were the biggest one, do not try to rely on willpower alone. You will be disappointed. Figure out some habits and systems so of course we have our time management system, but that's only one system. Other systems will help you reduce your distractibility in your daily life. Whether it's always having your keys in the same place, whether it's having the same nighttime routine that helps you fall asleep, whether it's always making sure, I call it a clean field before I start cooking. <laughs> so it's whether you always clean your kitchen before you start to do something else. Whatever it is, figure out some habits and systems so that you're not having to always use willpower to bring your attention back to the task. That's exhausting. Most of you have probably heard about de decision fatigue. We only have a certain amount of willpower and decision-making capacity in a day. And if you are having to constantly bring your attention back or you get distracted by some chaos on your desk constantly and you're having to like, Notice it, decide it's irrelevant, and bring your attention back. 
that's actually using up your that finite resource you have of willpower so that by the end of the day, you might make poor choices, stay up late, eat a bunch of junk food, drink more alcohol than you want. So use habits and systems. When we consider how to control the distractions in our lives, we want to think about the ones we have control over. Some we don't. If you have an infant who is disrupting your sleep, you don't have control over that. But if you have a phone that is alerting you constantly, you do have control over that. I One of the first things I suggest is turning off all notifications. So I never have things popping up on my computer. I don't have the little numbers in my in the bar at the bottom, my menu at the bottom that says I have emails. That is all very distracting for me. If you can, turn it all off and have a clean field. <laughs> Take control of what you can. Continuing on with the phone, there's some research that tells us that having your phone in your line of sight, even if it's face down and turned off like mine is right now, it's still taking my attention. So really, it should be out of my sight. I just threw it over my shoulder. I probably shouldn't have done that. But anyway, I did. Impulsive. So put away your phone, have it out of your line of sight, because a portion of your attention is actually on it, even if it's turned off and face down, if it's in your line of sight. So give yourself a break and do yourself a favor and put it out of sight. Procrastination. My friend, a common topic of discussion with in coaching calls. Procrastination is interesting. If it's a problem for you, it is almost for everybody. And people with ADHD tend to have a bigger problem with it. But if it's a problem for you, be curious about why you do it. Because everybody says, I procrastinate and I hate it and I wish I didn't do it. People aren't dumb. We would not do something if it was only bad. There must be a payoff. So consider why you procrastinate and how it might be working for you, because it is at some level. If you can think about kind of what you're getting out of it and what it's costing you, you might actually realize there's a space where you can intervene in your own life. Maybe you can meet that need another way, like maybe what you're getting out of it. You could do that another way, or maybe there's a hidden agenda in there for yourself. You know, if I if I always do my paper at the last minute, you know, and I get that adrenaline rush and it makes me feel like a superpower, you know, maybe I get that another way. Because if I only do my paper, you know, the night before it's due, when I was at university, for example, there's no way I'll do as well as if I had given myself a bit more time. And so I'm sort of robbing myself of my best work in that context. So maybe I get my adrenaline rush another way. So this is what I was just saying, understanding how it works for you, working with your need for adrenaline. It's like I, it's like I knew what I was gonna say. But I wanna say this working with your need for adrenaline, this is a part of ADHD that and it can be a part of just our temperament. You don't have to have ADHD to be a, a more interested in risk taking and stimulus seeking than than your neighbor. This is not something that you can change about yourself. You can't suddenly become a person who doesn't like driving fast and doesn't like roller coasters. So you have to work with it. Um, don't try to turn yourself into a person you're not. Just understand kind of the kind of person you are and what makes you tick so that you can uh, work with that as opposed to feeling horrible about yourself and like there's something wrong with you all the time that has to be changed. So now that was what I wanted to say. So I've left us tons of time for questions. I'll stop sharing. And maybe there's things happening in the chat that, uh, or there could be now things happening in the chat. Um, so far, uh, there is just one question, which I've already put into the chat, the answer, oh, okay. but, uh, the one question, oh, okay. Hey guys, I'm monitoring the chat here. Get your questions in. We've got the expert in front of us here. <laughs> She's the one who's got some really good answers. I'm going to, I'm going to start you off with one question, Claire, because, um, this is important for me and it did come up in the, when we did the, the groups. And that is, is how does one go about uh, knowing whether or not one has ADHD? How does one measure ADHD? Huh. That's how a great does one question. get a diagnosis of? Oh, okay. Well, those are different questions. Okay. So yeah. like, I don't know that we could measure ourselves, whether no. or not we have ADHD. Um, 
there's it's it's actually a controversial topic, like many things. There is a subset of people who don't like that ADHD has disorder in it because they they um, would prefer to consider uh, the attention problems that are characterized by ADHD um, as on a continuum from neurotypical to problematic. And while I respect that, I do, and as a person who is sort of near the distractible end, um, I can appreciate that I don't necessarily want to be labeled as disordered. I I don't agree that that considering it as just a sort of a version of neurotypical is helpful. At least I don't find it helpful because then it 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 becomes normalized and minimized by people who will say, well, we all have a little ADHD, don't we? We all forget things like, you know, it's all it's all part of getting older or something like that. And so to, to me, going, you know, if you ha- if you are invested in your own well-being and you want to really understand, is this is this worse for me than maybe it is for other people? Like my life feels harder. And is this just pandemic? Is it just that I had a baby? Is it just, you know, when you might have reasons? Or is it lifelong? And it's actually always been a little bit harder for me. And I've just sort of bumped along. If that's the case, you can go see a psychologist. You can go see your family doc. You can certainly educate yourself. But ultimately, how it gets decided is if you um, have a history from childhood, because currently the diagnosis is that it needs to be present before age 12, <laughs> if it's always been present in one way or another. So I have a PhD. I I liked school. I was pretty good at school, but I was always chatting in class. I was in detention all the time. So had we been looking at, you know, likable kid, everybody liked me, but I was quite disruptive, actually. And I was busy from morning to night. So it's sort of if we've been looking, which in the 70s, we weren't, I probably would have been diagnosed with ADHD then. But I didn't get diagnosed till I was an adult because I bumped along and managed until I didn't. So you go see someone who knows you might do cognitive testing, but you don't have to. It's not part of it's not required for diagnosis to have impairments on cognitive testing. I would not have impairments on cognitive testing. It's more likely to be hopefully a long interview or in my case, the way I do it is I send a huge history form in advance and I have people do quite a few questionnaires in advance and then I do the long interview. But either way, it should be it's a quite a substantial assessment to really understand what might be causing your day-to-day problem with attention, overwhelm, distractibility, procrastination, whatever it is, because there's many sources of poor attention. And to me, my job is to rule out all the possibilities until there's nothing left. And I think, okay, this does look like ADHD, because usually by the time someone comes to me, it's not a simple checkboxing like, yep, clearly you have ADHD. Occasionally that happens, but that's very rare. People are complicated by the time they see me, they've had lives. And so there's usually an anxiety disorder that has developed possibly as a result of the ADHD or there's a substance use problem. So to me, it's it really requires um, a long conversation with somebody who understands ADHD at a deep level. And, and I guess the, the thing that I want to add is, is that's partly where if you go to our website and look for a psychologist, you can find those people who do those kinds of assessments and a person like me does not do those kinds of assessments. <laughs> but lots of us do. Lots yes, of us do. no, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, uh, pros and cons of ADHD medications. Well, I'm not anti-medication by any means. I I use medication myself um, on days that I think I need it. Um, And certainly I notice a difference on days I I use it versus days I don't. But it's not the only way. And it it does help with that low arousal. So that's, I'm one of those people, I could fall asleep in a lecture at university easily, even if I was interested in the class. Like I have that low arousal version. And so it helps me stay awake and it helps me kind of manage a little bit of the like visual movement's a big distractor for me. So it helps me manage that, you know, window beside my office, for example. It does not help me plan and organize, and it doesn't help me with procrastination. <laughs> so medication has its place. Um, it, it will help you with sustained attention a little bit more and a little bit maybe of managing distractibility. And that, and if that's all you expect of it, you will not be disappointed. But if you, and sometimes it can help a little bit with the regulation 
ironically, a stimulant can sometimes help a little bit with um, anxiety because it's the attention is is what's actually underneath the anxiety. So improved attention can reduce, you know, dial down the anxiety. And if it doesn't, if your anxiety is higher, then that was actually your biggest problem. And so sometimes people will have both diagnosis, but the stimulant is not helpful for them. But there's other options. There are non-stimulant medications. Some of the um, SNRIs like Welbutrin, Stratera, they're a little bit alerting. And so they can sometimes be better tolerated. And there's other things that are sort of second line treatments, which I'm not as much expert on. I'm not a psychiatrist um, and I don't prescribe. You know, so I'm not anti-medication at all, but what I know is that without habit change and without systems, and I saw some questions about systems, um, which maybe we could get to at some point, it won't be enough. Like, it just won't be enough. Right. Okay. Um, and there's been a couple of people asking about ADHD and uh, other uh, problems. So one of them is perfectionism. Another one is chronic fatigue. Let's see what else we have here. Uh, yeah, things like that. Uh, do you have any comments on perfectionism, chronic fatigue? Those well, like I, things? I'll start with, I talked about perfectionism a little bit earlier. So yep. um, if there's a specific question around that, maybe the person could put it in the chat now and it'll come up for Patrick to see. Yep. So I'll go to the chronic fatigue one. The Earlier when I talked about the distractibility and every time something is in my environment and I have to look at it and like I orient to it, I can't help it. Like if I've taken this stimulant, maybe I might be able to re resist, but chances are I'm gonna orient. My attention just gets dragged, I can't help it. I don't have good attentional control, remember? And then I have to bring my attention back. That takes mental energy. And so if I'm doing that all day and I'm managing my own self-critical thoughts or maybe my partner's self-critical or critical, you know, so I'm managing my own reactions and maybe some shame around that, all of this takes emotional energy. So I am going to be more tired at the end of the day because I'm literally working harder to get through the day than a person who doesn't have ADHD. This is the distort disorder piece. It's it has a cost to your life if you have this. It is, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Okay. Did the perfectionism question uh, come no, up? No, I didn't see it come okay. through. So, so maybe, uh, yeah. how about neurofeedback and ADHD? Hmm. You want to speak to? I have a call. So, I'm not an expert. And when I read, about and I haven't I'm not uh, totally up to date but I read about it when it first came out because there was a lot of excitement about it um it, there wasn't clear evidence that it had lasting gains but what but people my patients and at the time it was for brain injury at first when they were doing it they they kind of liked it like it felt like it was doing something and it certainly by helping them, you know, it felt like, I think it was helping them with attentional control a little bit because you're like controlling a ball on the screen with your mind, that kind of thing. So it, you are having to keep doing whatever it is you're doing that's moving the ball. So it's attentional control. So from that perspective, I can't see how it wouldn't be helpful. Um, one of my colleagues in Ontario, Chris Friesen, I think that's his name, um, Dr. Friesen, Anyway, he's an expert in it, and he and he really believes that neurofeedback is important in assessment and in the treatment of ADHD. And so I don't have more to tell you because I'm not the expert in that, but I think we might there might be more, you know, in in mainstream media soon because i I think maybe we're learning more about how it might be useful. Yep, okay. Um, how about? people who are coping with ADHD, adult ADHD in particular, and then they're also using substances on the side. So the two particular ones that are happening these days are alcohol and cannabis. Mm -hmm. but, you know, there's some new ones coming along too. So do you have any comments on the use of these substances? In well, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, it's alcohol and cannabis would both be considered depressants. And so if you're, if you so a lot, I, I do assess with a lot of people who more cannabis typically than alcohol, they're using it often for sleep or to dial down their anxiety. And it's very difficult for me to parse out kind of what are, what's the attention problem from sedation because THC is sedating. Um, 
versus and just kind of being zoned out from chronic cannabis use and a lack of motivation is that contributing to procrastination you know that kind of thing versus ADHD and then what is the anxiety itself that they're using the cannabis for how much is that distracting them and those anxious thoughts and ruminations so I think it's a little bit tricky when someone's using a lot of cannabis. I don't tend to diagnose when someone's using a lot because I don't feel like I have a clear view of what might be going on for them um, with the understanding that they can't just stop using cannabis until we give them a better way to manage their anxiety. And so I wouldn't suggest you just stop if that's the tool you're using, but it makes it difficult for us to see what's really happening. Alcohol is sort of, well, I mean, it's similar. Obviously, you're probably not... You know, I mean, most people I think would understand that alcohol dulls our dulls our senses, makes us more inhibited, and we're more likely to be impulsive in our speech and what have you. I'm not sure it would cause attention problems. It might cause memory problems because it's we know that that can happen. Um, I I see substance use in the way of alcohol and cannabis as sort of managing anxiety that might be a result of ADHD or of history of trauma, which can also accompany ADHD. I see use of other stimulants. So I hear a lot about cocaine use. I hear a lot of mushroom use. So these are stimulants actually. And so I think those people or tons of caffeine, those people might be trying to self-medicate um, and they can they find that they are more focused and, and effective when they use the stimulant. And so that's interesting to me because it may be that they actually would benefit from a prescription of a stimulant. But if you have a history of cocaine abuse, a doctor is going to be reluctant, a physician is going to be reluctant to prescribe a stimulant to you because you have a history of abuse. So it's a, it's a bit of a vicious circle. Um, but the long acting stimulant, as long as you don't crush it and snort it, is not going to become a drug of abuse. So it, I think it's if you have that history and you're curious about whether or not you actually might be trying to treat your own ADHD by using these substances, you could try a long acting stimulant. You will not get a high. You will not get a high. <laughs> But you might actually get the um, kind of focused attention that that was part of what you were seeking, if you can live without the high. Yeah. So here's a curious question. Uh, this is the last question that I've got. So I'm sort of skipping all over the questions. Oh, no. Trying, okay. <laughs> to, trying to weed out the ones that are very similar and trying to ask. So this one's an interesting one. And uh, considering what you have described about your own life course, so uh, Kurian in 2013 did a survey found that 0.06% of young adults with ADHD held a graduate degree compared to 5.4% of norms. Mm -hmm. should, some with, should someone with ADHD avoid a career mm -hmm. regarding higher levels of education given the increased challenges they may experience academically? That's an excellent question. And it's a tragic question, too. It makes me sad to think that there are um, reasonable accommodations that a student with a diagnosis of ADHD or another um, psychiatric disorder can get from a university. You know, there are laws around this that, you know, there are accommodations that you can get. The trick is, is with ADHD, it feels like the bar is a little bit higher, at least in my experience with universities. You know, if someone comes to me and I diagnose them with social anxiety disorder, they can get a certain number of accommodations without question. But if I diagnose them with ADHD, in that case, the university does require um, cognitive testing. They treat it like a learning disorder. And so they require me to attach the weakness, whether it's slow processing speed or it might be slow output. Their thinking speed might be fast, but their output might be slow, for example. Um, I have to tie that to the learning problem to justify the academic accommodation. So it feels like there's a bit of a double standard. But all that aside, there are accommodations that can actually make life easier for the ADHD student. And there are also executive function coaches. And so earlier when I said get a time management system, if you are a person who I read a comment earlier, they're just like, I've tried lots and I get bored, I can't stick to them. I hear that a lot. And I don't think that you know, the um, calendar tool that that we created at Boss Your Brain is so fancy and perfect that people are going to use it. I have no illusions about that. I think all of all of the calendar systems are subject to boredom. That's kind of the point. So 
having a coach, someone that you are accountable to, that helps structure your thinking a little bit. They might help you chunk down big tasks in order to tackle, you know, the big one, the big one, so you don't just do the little tasks because and procrastinate the big one. Um, I think in com so there may be things that a student with ADHD would benefit from. I did get my PhD, but man, I fell through my undergraduate truly. My master's, you're just, this, you're so busy. I was running all the time and my PhD was similar. Like it's not, it could have gone much easier for me had I understood myself better and had I had been able to obtain more support. And so I muscled through it because I'm a perfectionist and that's what I do, but it didn't. So it, it's, it's possible to do it, but it didn't have, to, it was hard. So I don't want to say don't do it, but I don't want to pretend that it won't be harder because I think it will be harder. But I think if you understand yourself a little bit better and you and you ask for help from people who actually could be helpful to you, like a specific coach who's experienced or you go to the Disability Resource Center. I never did that. It wouldn't have occurred to me. I think it would probably be easier and you should be able to level the playing field, which is the whole point of an academic accommodation. We're not trying to give anybody an advantage over another student. We're trying to bring them up to the same level so that they are starting from the same place. And I think if that happened, why wouldn't you be able to graduate? Right. The person who was asking about perfectionism just was asking for more tips on how to deal with perfectionism. You, once you've done the pros and cons and you and you look at, you know, are there any kind of hidden benefits that I'm getting from my perfectionism? So, you know, this if am I warding off, you know, if I'm worried about criticism, for example, because when I get criticized, I feel incompetent, it activates something in me that's very uncomfortable. So I edit and over edit and I make everything like beyond reproach. Nobody could criticize it. If that's kind of my payoff is that I am genuinely perfect, like no one could ever criticize me. It's good to know that about myself because then I have to decide, is that necessary? Like, am I so fragile that I have to spend this much time wording off criticism? Maybe I am, or maybe there are certain contexts. You know, I always use the example of when I write medical legal reports for court. It would not look good if a judge pointed out a typo in my report or some kind of mistake. So I do spend a lot of time edit editing those, but that standard's not required anywhere else. And so I have to be able to limit the amount of time I spend on other written documents. So I'm not just wasting time trying to make everything meet that same standard. The other, I think, hidden benefit from perfectionism is that if I, um, that, that how it drives procrastination is that I, that remember I said, if I like wait to the last minute, I get the adrenaline rush because I got it done. But I also can, I never have to test a story that if I started earlier, I could actually get a better mark. So if I always just do it at the last minute and squeak by and I'm like, nailed it, didn't have to do more work than that. I never have to kind of test my kind of something that might be a bit threatening to my ego that maybe that's actually the best I could do. Right. Okay. Um, how about ADHD and autism? Uh, some person read that ADHD is not autism, but that each can lead to the other. How do we differentiate between the two? They're very different. They can coexist though. ADHD does not lead to autism and autism does not lead to ADHD. They are very separate entities, but they can both, they are both present in childhood by definition. They just might not be diagnosed in childhood. Though autism is typically recognized earlier than ADHD because it's, um, it's just more apparent to family um, and, and people who are interacting. Um, oh my gosh, that's a very big question, but they, they are not the same at all. Right. Okay. Um, how about this is an interesting mm -hmm. one? Maybe this is what you were talking about. I'm not sure. Can you comment on adrenaline induced emotional sanctuary? If I'm not sure what that asked, means either. Yeah. If the person who asked that is willing to speak, I would be really interested in what that means because I'm not sure. Oh, there's a book link. Oh, that's that's our book. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Um, I don't know what that is, but I'm curious about it now. Maybe while they're thinking about that or 
there was an accommodation request. What accommodations would you recommend for those with ADHD and open work, open work concept? That is my nightmare open work concept. I, if, oh my gosh, having to work without a door would make me cry. And so uh, if you are in an environment where you're in an open space, you must get noise canceling headphones and you must get a little flag, like a symbol or something that's on your desk that tells other people when you can be inter interrupted and when you, so it's like a closed door. You have to protect your space because otherwise you will not get anything done. So in those times where I have been in that environment, I've got, I would, I used to wear earplugs, but they have better headphones now, right? Um, and if you're having to answer the phone all the time, maybe make them talk to that or something like surely the technology is there for that, but protect your, what's coming into your ears. And ideally, if you can, like if your desk could face a wall, so you're not seeing movement all the time, like just literally find a way to reduce the incoming stimuli into your brain so that you can focus on your work and then have that signal. So I know a client, I'm, I keep doing this pointing at my desk. There was like a little flag. And when that green flag was up, they didn't mind being interrupted. What they were working on was sort of routine. And when a red flag was up, it was, and they had discussed this with their coworkers that for several hours of uh, certain days, they could not be interrupted. And they respect, the coworkers respected that once they understood, once they saw that the other person was much more productive, and that of course helps everybody, um, they saw the result, then they were willing to respect it. Won't be perfect, you know, but in times when I've had, like when I worked at the hospital, I had a door I could close. And I think it saved my life. <laughs> so I feel your pain. I do. Okay. So here's an interesting one. When there is an overlap of ADHD symptoms and diagnosed anxiety, depression, burnout, and knowing that there may be gender differences, this person is an adult woman. How does someone navigate with this, uh, especially with finding treatment? So, so dual diagnosis okay. of, say, for instance, depression and ADHD. And true to form, I let myself go to the chat and I just got distracted and I missed the first part. So dual diagnosis, depression and ADHD in an adult woman. Yes. And yes. there was something else. You and said how, does one, how does one navigate uh, <laughs> that? So I would treat the depression first. Um, if you if you are already taking an antidepressant, um, depending on how bad your depression is, then you are treating the depression first, at least a beginning part. Or if you're already taking a stimulant and it's not working, then you need to go speak to your doctor about that. Like if you're whatever you're taking, if you're still your mood is very low, you're having early morning awakenings, you're having that negative cycle of thinking and the world just all feels negative and the future feels terrible. That means your depression is not under control. And so if though, on some days you feel not too bad, and when your ADHD symptoms are actually causing perceived failures and you're experiencing negative consequences and then your yeah. mood tanks, then actually the ADHD is the biggest problem and that needs to be addressed first. So from my perspective, if your depression is very bad and you are actually hopeless and suicidal, that's a crisis and you need to deal with that first. But if it feels responsive to your ADHD being unmanaged, then that's what you deal with first. Like it, I wouldn't try to solve everything at once put out the fire that is the biggest first. Okay, um, here's a good one. Are there any particular resources that you would recommend for our own further reading uh, research, especially around developing strategies to be more productive at work, uh, environments, you know, all this kind of stuff. So any recommendations? So I know that there is the one um, by Hallowell. I don't know if you recommend mm -hmm. that one. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind it. He's sort of in the ADHD as a superpower camp, but I'm not really a fan of that. Um, gosh, there are, there's many. I mean, I have a pile of books, which I could go get if you wait a second, but um, I should have brought my pile of books. You know, it's, it's an accountability partner of some sort. So whether it be a coach or a friend, and they don't have to have ADHD, but if they have ADHD, it's better because then they're much more understanding and have more empathy for you. And it shouldn't be your spouse, just so you know, that's not your accountability partner. Um, you know, I'm, I, I don't I want to seem self-serving, but it's like being in a group is very helpful. And that's, so that's like for the bosses that are on the call, you could probably comment on that. Like 
taking taking being in some kind of support group or having access to other adults with ADHD is enormously validating because every time someone will say, you know, I've got this problem, you get 30 me too's. And that's very helpful, you know, with respect to just managing the day to day um, trials and tribulations. You know, there's lots out there. There's, you know, information for the individual with ADHD. There's an, there's information like in terms of books, there's information for couples where one or both partners have ADHD. Parents of a child with ADHD, which is of course very common. It's a highly heritable condition. You know, so a lot of people come to me after their child has been diagnosed and they're wondering if they have it because it feels very similar. And in fact, they often do. And yes. so, right. So, you know, for me to like, I what I'll do um, is I'm pretty sure on the Be the Boss of Your Brain website, we have a resources page. And I, I've got a couple of books on there that I recommend. And what I can do is I can send a, a list to Alejandra that when um, she posts the talk, she can put she can put that there as well. Because within sure. my group, we have lots like I have lots of book recommendations. Perfect. Excellent. There's a there is a video series. Um, there's a young actor and she has this series called How to ADHD. It's quite good. So if you okay. haven't checked her out on YouTube, you know, what she the information she provides is good. I think she might have a psychologist consulting with her. Um, she does a good job. Good, good. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, clients can have difficulties being consistent in forming habits. Uh, would you focus on reducing barriers for their habit goals or how would you go about supporting them in creating these new habits that are going to be more helpful? Totally. So as a psychologist and as a coach, and it sounds like this is somebody who's, who's supporting people with ADHD um, asking this question, I go back to um, motivational interviewing techniques and thinking about stage of change. So if they, if they, if we decide on some sort of habit, I'm always finding out from them how likely it is that they're going to do it. And then when we do decide that they're going to do it, we're very concrete. When are you going to do it? What might get in the way? Like we do a lot of when we when we're doing any kind of goal setting, it's very literal and concrete. And then we put it on the calendar and it's like, this is the day I'm going to do this. And then they try it for a couple of days. And then we talk again quite, a, quite soon after so that they can be giving feedback to me, whether they did it, not at all, or they did it, but this was a problem, you know, and I, and my, my approach is always, if the homework didn't go well, then it was my bad. Like I didn't set it up very well. Um, they should always be succeeding at whatever we do, because when you come into a late diagnosis of ADHD, you've had a lifetime of perceived failure. It might not be true failure, but you feel like it. And so you just, you need a win. And so really being careful to have a stepped approach to habit change. And each of you, I think those of you that are trying to adopt a time management system, or whatever, keep your expectations reasonable at the beginning. Don't expect to suddenly be a master and use whatever this bullet journal is. I don't even know what it is. I looked at it and it just overwhelmed me. And so, you know, whatever system you start using, start using one part of it. And then maybe the next month, once you feel like you got that one under control, start using another part of it. You know, and some of these journals have like, write down your goals. Oh my God, don't do any of that. Just do the part that works for you. And whatever works for you is the right thing. Right. Okay. Um, so we were uh, earlier talking about adrenaline induced mm -hmm. emotional sanctuary. This person heard about it a couple of years ago. Um, the term just resonated with them and they can't find the source on it now. Uh -huh. so that's okay. Thank you for looking. Adrenaline yeah. induced, adrenaline induced emotional sanctuary. And so, I mean, I don't know if it's like at the, at the end. So I've had the adrenaline rush and I've had that burst. And once it's over, I have calm. So it could be like that cycle of, you know, a little bit of fatigue and a little bit of calm. And that's the only time you feel stable. That's a possibility. Um, that's what I was thinking. It might be when you first mentioned it, but I, I don't want to, I don't know, right? I'm just making stuff up. <laughs> yep. Okay. There is something about what are the odds of someone dodging ADHD if both parents have ADHD? If the ADHD is treated when they were raising you, um, reasonable. If you grew up in a chaotic household and you have a genetic risk, the odds are low. Good. You're probably going to get it. <laughs> okay. How about uh, ADHD and uh, identity issues? So, namely, 
the ones that this person is uh, listing are borderline or PTSD. Yeah. Well, PTSD isn't an identity issue, but um, it's a reaction. It's a normal reaction to a very traumatic event, right? But um, certainly it can feel like that if you've had multiple traumatic events or you have complex PTSD. Um, ADHD and borderline personality traits, so borderline personality disorder, can coexist. Um, there are some, sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I think of it as a continuum, because we have the dysregulated emotions and the kind of intense reactions it, just that an ADHD and then that gets can be much more extreme as you know we go towards borderline but expert psychiatrists that you know continuing education stuff that I've done say they are different and they coexist and I believe them so the intense mood swings that we see with borderline um, personality and the intense hypervigilance and intense fear reaction that we see with PTSD. These are well beyond the typical symptom of ADHD. While ADHD in its most severe form can be quite damaging, you know, a lot of people in who are incarcerated have ADHD. Um, it, ha it can have significant consequences in an adult's life. It is typically different in degree from borderline and PTSD, which are very serious problems and, and are hugely damaging to someone's life and their relationships, um, but they can coexist. Sometimes though, I'll have somebody come to me and I end up diagnosing them with um, PTSD instead. Like it, that, it's often that instead of ADHD, but not always. There was a question about, um, uh, your partner, your 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 one of your loved ones has ADHD, and they're yeah. not curious about it, and they don't want to seek treatment. The, I'm I'm actually going to go get it. One second. There's a book that I find most helpful, and I was just reading it before the call. Perfect. So perfect. Just talk would amongst be, yourselves. Would it be <laughs> Would it be okay if I answer a question for oh, you? Oh yeah, Karen? please do. I, I heard back. this one a couple of years ago. So there's a person here who has said that they work in a very busy shop. Stimulus comes from you, uh, comes at you from every direction. Noise canceling headphones might not be possible since I have to engage with my client. So feels very drained, et cetera, et cetera. What else can I do besides uh, noise canceling headphones? So seeing how you're back, do you have an answer? I have one answer. You can go ahead. Oh, okay. So I ran into a psychologist when I was doing my PhD, and he suggested just one earplug in one ear. And you have to figure out which one is going to be more effective, because some people it's more effective in the right ear, some people it's more effective in the left ear, mm -hmm. uh, it sort of depends on how your brain is constructed. That doesn't stop it. But that again, you know, especially with the noise canceling, what you're trying to do is you're trying to bring the noise down. This doesn't stop the noise, but it will help at least block half the noise on half your head. There's also, um, they call them attenuators. So after brain injury, we also often recommend them. Yep. And so they're a bit more expensive, but they're in both yep. ears and they reduce a lot of noise, but they let speech in. Yep. And so if, if that's what you're wanting to be able to hear, but none of the other noises, um, attenuators, um, earplugs can be helpful. The other thing that I would suggest is that you make sure you take your breaks. And so if you're in an environment where it's always noisy and you're being, you know, just a lot of attentional demands, you need to leave that environment for your break. You need to sit somewhere else that's a little bit quieter and you can just eat your lunch or you can go outside for a walk. Ideally, you can look at nature, like just to give yourself a little bit of green therapy. Um, so it's make sure you take your breaks because you need them. Like we all need them, but in that environment, you really do need them. Some, so many good questions. How doing bad okay, temper, you had a book. This is a book that, the reason I like this one um, as for, for loved ones, like loving, you know, if you're living with somebody who has ADHD is it doesn't make the non ADHD partner wholly responsible. And because of some of the books I've read or, you know, like Barclay wrote a book, it was so depressing. It's just basically like you have to parent your spouse. It's not at all what I'm interested in. Um, and so I like that book and I think it's a great resource. And I used it actually, um, when I was with my co-boss, co coach developing um, the course we have for people with ADHD in relationships. It's for the person with ADHD. So 
because we're we're trying to help them learn to manage themselves in a shame free zone. But I also but we also meet with you know the loved ones once or twice to you know just provide them a little support because there's not a lot out there for people supporting. Going back to that, if the person isn't interested in um, getting support, that's what cued me about this book. There's a little section on that. And really, it's when you've started dating or marrying this person, you might not have known what, that they had ADHD. This might be a new diagnosis that explains a lot. And probably if you if your loved one got a diagnosis, you might have been relieved at first because it's like, oh, well, that helps me understand. And then you might have thought we can get a treatment. Either they don't want to get a treatment because, or they don't like the diagnosis. They reject it. It makes them feel bad about themselves, whatever. Maybe they don't believe ADHD is a thing, whatever. Or they get treatment, but it doesn't solve things because like I said at the beginning, medication is not enough. Um, and it's just disappointing. The relief will quickly sour and you will be very frustrated. All I can say is you, the person you are with always had this problem. And just as a person with ADHD should never try to be someone they're not, I think we, when we love somebody who has ADHD or ADHD traits, we have to accept that that comes with them. We can't love the person we want them to be. We might have to grieve the, that we didn't marry a person that we thought, like they're different than we thought they were going to be, or they, this is always going to be with you. In our course, we call it the third partner. It's a it's a third partner in your relationship that's not going to go away and it has to be addressed. You you can't pretend it's not there. And so you might have to grieve the plans, like the idea you had of yourself in your marriage or in your lives in the future that might be derailed because of ADHD. And so if you're if your spouse or partner is not interested in treating their ADHD, I think if you can start to come to terms with this is the person that I choose to be with and I have to accept how they are. That doesn't mean you have to accept everything. It may be that you make different choices. Like if your spouse is always late, then you know this about them and you no longer expect them to be on time and you act accordingly. Maybe you meet them at the venue rather than waiting for them to pick you up and then you're both late. Or maybe you time your timing is different. You know, you eat you just don't wait. You just eat. And then when they get home, they eat. I, guess, I think if you change your life and take back some control over yourself, your resentment will probably go down. But it's we can't make somebody do anything, actually. We can't make them get treatment. But I think if you start to kind of accommodate them and they're not having to push against you so hard and defend themselves so hard, they might actually be able to be curious about it themselves. Um, here's an interesting question. Somebody says they've heard there are several different types of ADHD. Uh, how do you see ADHD? Well, the, the diagnostic manuals do have different types. Um, you know, I, in an, in children, you know, often the hyperactivity is what's observed first because the child is disruptive in a classroom. So it's often the teacher that identifies it. Um, but there, of course, are the quietly inattentive kids as well who are just zoned out and daydreaming and looking out the window. But they're not typically a problem in class. So those guys that usually are under the radar or they're like me and they are hyperactive and disruptive, but still doing well. And so nobody's noticing. Right. I think in adults, hyperactivity is less likely to be, you know, getting out of your seat, being disruptive, but it might be a lot of fidgeting. You know, I don't know if you could tell I'm standing and I'm like moving a lot. I'm trying to be still because I know it's distracting, but I can't be still. And so I usually have a fidget. I don't have it right now. Um, or they exercise a lot, you know, a lot, you know, or they're tapping their foot or whatever. So, or chatty. For me, it's chatty. And so, you know, it, it can manifest in different ways in adulthood than miss, than in childhood. But I, I still see the types. Um, inattentive type, I think, in adults is most common. But I diagnose combined type quite a lot. And occasionally, I have diagnosed hyperactive type because they don't seem inattentive. And they're not particularly disorganized, which often accompanies inattentive. But they're quite impulsive and incredibly active. 
And if they're not, they're, they, the wheels come off. So I think hyperactive, seem, pure hyperactive seems less common in adulthood. That's what I see. Okay. And I see this one about how can we handle our bad temper? Can I answer yes. that one? I was yeah. going to get to that one, yes. Yeah, Thank I you. like that one. It's a good question. And I really yeah. appreciate the taking responsibility for that um, because it is our responsibility to manage our, our own reactions. Um, the it it off of course it depends on the circumstance you know but what I do know is if you are constant if you know people who are like aggressive drivers and have road rage and are just irritable a lot and it's a it's a frequent occurrence in your day to day lives you are having a big adrenaline hit all the time from that anger so that might be a secret payoff just to be aware. But that adrenaline spike and a little bit of anxiety and anger, it actually, you know, higher blood pressure, you know, changes in blood pressure, it shortens your life. It is, you know, research from years and years ago on type A, it was heart disease research. Those kind of hostile type A personalities had heart attacks more and they died younger. And so it's not good for us to be irritable and angry all the time. Um, also, I'll just say that. But the way we can manage it is we can be curious about it. Is there a particular trigger to our anger? Does it feel that it is um, always coming up in the same context? I'm usually more irritable late at night when I'm tired. It's not a good time for me to have a deep conversation. You know, are there patterns to your anger? And so when you when you think about why either why do I fight with this person or why am I getting angry all the time? Just like I had, I suggested you do that productivity tracker and you kind of look at how you're spending your time. You might do the same thing about your angry reactions and just notice when they happen. Notice the context, who was there, what was happening. There may be patterns and then you could actually do something about it. Okay. But you can't necessarily, like don't medicate yourself. Don't take a depressant like cannabis just so that you're not so angry. That's not a solution. It's Your solution is going to be more through um, recognizing contexts that are risky, maybe the triggers and doing a little bit of stimulus control, managing your environment a little bit. Yeah. Uh, a quick one here. Um, I actually don't know the answer, but I suspect. Uh, so is there a relationship that you know of between ADHD and Parkinson's or any of the dementias? I don't know that there is. Okay. It's um, yeah. I don't. I don't know that there is. Parkinson's is dopamine is involved in Parkinson's, um, but it's quite different. The the part of the brain, the substantia nigra, which, that makes dopamine, dies, and it, Parkinson's is is because there's no dopamine and not enough dopamine in the basal ganglia, which is where we start where movement is coordinated, and so it's just a that's a deep brain structure, whereas ADHD happens more in the cortical frontal lobes. So I don't, dopamine is, is a similarity, but dopamine isn't the only neuro trans, neuromodulator actually that's involved in either case. Yeah. Okay. Anything about the other dementias? Uh, Alzheimer's, Alzheimer's disease MS. is a very, MS isn't a dementia, but it can have cognitive impairment attached to it. So eventually they might have dementia from um, more damage epilepsy could eventually you know as if the more seizures you have if they're causing scarring you could i suppose eventually have functional dementia alzheimer's is a very different thing it has um they're called plaques and tangles that develop in your brain that they just um they twist up brain cells and those neurons die those are the tangles and plaques are like little strokes and it has a particular pattern it starts it starts in the part of the brain that forms memories and accesses our old memories, which is why memory impairment is the first problem. But eventually it's all over the brain and people don't recognize like food and they eat buttons. And like it's it's I don't think there is a relationship between ADHD and these things. There is a relationship between brain injury because it reduces our cognitive reserve. And so we just might show dementia more earlier in our lives if we have less reserve. Similarly, with more education, that's a protective factor, and it gives us more cognitive reserve. But I, I'm interested now, and I'll look at I'll look it up. But I, it's never come across my searches um, a relationship with any of the dementias and ADHD. Um, I have a sad story here. 
partner and I are parents of a child with ADHD. We're both looking into getting diagnosed. Our GP has provided a questionnaire for my partner that is normally provided to parents for children. Um, we're new immigrants and we're wondering if our GP is qualified to diagnose uh, with such short forms. Ouch. Legally, they are, yeah. they're allowed. They have that privilege of diagnosis. Whether or not your GP um, is knowledgeable about ADHD, I think is maybe your question. Um, maybe not. The and because you know you're immigrants to Canada, you have things happening. You have other things, possibly language um, barriers for you that are going to impact your functional attention. And so. Yeah, I, I I would be reluctant to just rely on a one single questionnaire in your case. Yep. I mean, in any case, I would be reluctant, but especially in yours. Okay. Uh, what about uh, somebody was asking about transcranial magnetic stimulation? Have you heard anything mm. about that and ADHD? I, you know, I've read about it. I the temp for everything, the results of that are temporary. But I think with same, then that's the same with neurofeedback. It does seem to have an effect, but it it doesn't seem to last. Um, but I have heard that from for there is temporary improvement um, after doing that treatment. So yeah, I think there's some evidence for it. Okay. Um, how about people who are working in, in the workforce who have uh, who are looking for work workplace accommodations and they have ADHD. Are mm -hmm. you familiar with any accommodations that are? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Um, and I think the CADRA website has um, quite a nice list. And again, I can provide that to Alejandra. Um, okay. That's public. You can find it. They have a nice list and they have a nice um, like letter, template letter that you can use to request Again, just like with the university, there are laws. The with with respect to employers, they are required to accommodate someone who has a diagnosis, like from a formal diagnosis from someone who's qualified to make that diagnosis, um, as long as it does not cause undue hardship, and that's a legal term. And so, as long as it doesn't cause undue hardship to the employer, they are required to accommodate you. So they have to be able to uh, within the confines of your job. The, but in practice, I don't think it's, I think it's new. Um, we're actually working, you know, we have some, one of our bosses right now, she's working through that with her employer and, and she's finding that she's having to jump through quite a few hoops and she's having to educate the powers that be, whether it be the person doing the assessment or the insurance company that, you know, supports her on how they can help her. Um, so I think this is a new area and, and it's actually something that we've been talking about a lot is, is maybe helping employers understand how they can help their staff who have ADHD. Cause I think it's not totally understood yet from the employer side. Um, interesting question here. I'm guessing that this person is a therapist. What are the benefits of ADHD so that we can then support that client? So I think, so I, again, I was like trying to plug my videos, but I made this is ADHD a superpower video. Yep. And I, and in that I had a little model of um, the positives of ADHD, like reframing some of the, the challenges of ADHD. Cause I do think there are some benefits to it. I, I am a pattern recognizer. Like I, I seem to recognize consistencies and patterns very easily. You know, if someone tells me a story, I'll be like, oh, this is just like when you said this, you know, and that seems to be, I think, a result of the loose associations in my head, everything's connected. And so I can notice patterns quite easily. So I take that as a good thing because it helps me in my work. Sometimes being loose associations and distractible is like not a good thing when I'm trying to change a subject five times in a conversation, but the pattern recognition, I think is good. There's a quite a a lot of writing on increased creativity. Um, I think that's, again, we will have be distracted by random thoughts that are very loosely connected to what's happening. But of course, that can fuel creativity and new ways of thinking about a problem. Um, I have one client who said that her coworkers liked her because she thinks outside the box. I think a lot of people with ADHD would get that feedback. 
People with ADHD often are ideas people, tons of ideas, but we're not so great with the follow through. So if we can celebrate the ideas and and sort of forgive the follow through, it's like I'll have 100 ideas and I don't actually care if we pick up any of them. I'm just they're going to keep coming. I can't help it. But please don't ask me to be the one to follow it through to completion because that's not likely. And so being able to recognize the strength and value that while also being aware that it's like, I'm the ideas person, I'm not the follow through person, someone else has to be that person. So if you're on a team, for example, or if you are um, a boss, and you have staff, like, really being thoughtful about who's around you to support you, who has the skills that you don't have. Right. Anything about uh, possible side effects of ADHD? In particular, one person was asking about aches and pains, but you know, other issues that might arise physically. You know, I'm thinking IBS, those kinds of things. In the any absence of medication. That, yeah. Any research on the the? You know, I the, have not heard of ADHD without medication causing physical problems. Um, I think if you have untreated ADHD and it's jacking up anxiety, you would have, there's a lot of physical problems that are connected to anxiety. And so, you know, the IBS and the headache and the tension and, and just the muscle tightness that can come from anxiety could certainly be a result of untreated ADHD. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't, I have never read anything about that. But the reason I asked about the medication is, of course, no medication is totally pure or and benign. And so a stimulant does have side effects. It can cause muscle cramping and it can cause, well, it can cause other problems. And so they're not, it's not the cure all, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, there's a lot of people. I like that people are, I like that people are answering um, yeah, yeah. Well, and and the other thing is, there's a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of people who are really enjoying this talk and who are yeah. Going, oh, and I just like that people are answering each other. I love it. Yeah. Like this is yeah. exactly what happens yeah. in this lovely community. And so if you don't, if you're not already connected with a support group of some kind, there's I know there are online support groups for ADHD that are very yeah. low cost. Um, I really encourage you to do that. And for most of them, you don't have to prove anything. You know, you don't need a diagnosis. No, we're always going to police this. Many roads lead to poor attention. And, and a lot of the same um, strategies will help no matter what road brought you to needing supports. And so don't let that be a barrier if you haven't got, got a diagnosis. Like it shouldn't matter. Um, it, the diagnosis only matters if you want medication or if you're trying to access some kind of accommodation. But if you just want support, the diagnosis is not relevant. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think I'm going to slowly wind this down here. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, Claire, very much for contributing more than, <laughs> and more than your normal time. Thank you so much. So I was going to add that again. So if you or a family member is in need of some help, you need a psychologist, we have our link uh, on the psychology website that you can search for a psychologist. Um, and uh, also we are, we do a number of things. One of the things that we do is we do do some advocacy. We go out to different unions, companies, uh, you know, HR departments, and we encourage them to increase um, to increase uh, money for for benefits that some people get. We are also running advocacy in that we're trying to get a psychologist into uh, all the doctor's offices. And last but not least is we're also trying to uh, talk to the government about the possibility of including some psychological services under MSP. So that would be really cool as if some people could, uh, you know, get something like that. So all kinds of stuff. Uh, do check out the website. I don't know if you've been looking, Claire, but you've been getting an awful lot of love there. So <laughs> you go. You did wonderful. You, well, you, you definitely everybody. lived up to expectations here. So this is great. Well, I'm really, I, I'm glad to do it. It's, it's a, such, it's a very common condition. And so yeah. I'm happy to share. <laughs>